Cookery for the aristocracy and cooking for the ordinary people were two completely different things. One of the most distinguishing elements of aristocratic dishes was the use of spices, including sugar, which was considered a spice during the Middle Ages. These had to be brought great distances, and so were very expensive, well beyond the reach of the peasant and barely within the reach of the upper levels of the merchant class. Another obvious difference was the amount and variety of meats, fish, and fowl the dishes of the nobility usually contained. The nobility and their households were at the top of the medieval food chain, and they didn't seem to hesitate at eating almost any creature, as the lengthy list of fish, birds, other animals near the beginning of this chapter shows. A final difference was that aristocrats regularly used food and dining as part of elaborate ceremonies to mark significant personal and political events, or simply to demonstrate and reinforce their status and bonds with their subordinates, peers, and superiors within their local or regional power structure. From the late 14th century through the end of the Middle Ages, the eating habits and methods of food preparation of the nobility can be reconstructed with more certainty than those of the general public because of the significant number of illustrations of their feasts, recipes books compiled by their chefs, and physical remains of their dining halls and kitchens that have survived. These provide a fascinating glimpse of how the elite of medieval society ate, drank, and socialized. While these people were the most important social and political figures of their day, it must be remembered that they were only a very small and very privileged fraction of society. Their lifestyles and tastes no more reflected the experiences of the average person than the lifestyles and tastes enjoyed by celebrities and world figures do today. That said, on with the show. Stuffed peacocks, fountains that spout wine, and dishes with live animals inside await. The production of meals for the nobility required trained specialists. Thus, the nobility employed professional chefs with support staffs to prepare their meals, both at home and while on the road, when touring their domains or traveling abroad. Depending on the size and importance of the household, the cooking staff could range from a cook, either alone or with a handful of assistants up to a chef with dozens of subordinates from skilled pastry and sauce chefs down to lowly scullions and kitchen varlets. Besides the personnel that prepared the food, noble households also had staff to serve the food. These staffs included the ewer who held and poured water from the ewer or pitcher for washing hands before the meal, the panter or pantler who kept the diner supplied with fine white bread rolls through the meal, cut loaves of bread into manageable pieces before they were served, and also trimmed loaves of stale, coarser bread into trenchers. Trenchers were disposable plates or shallow bowls of stale bread that absorbed sauces. They were rarely eaten at the feast, and but were kept as leftovers for later snacking, or more typically, given away to the poor by the household's almoner, who was responsible for overseeing the disbursement of his master's charity. The butler and or cellarer in charge of beverages, so named because he was responsible for the butts of beer and wine stored in the cellar or buttery. He also oversaw the spicing and decanting of wines into jugs and bottles for serving. This use of bottles may have also given rise to the term butler, but the similarity and shared roots of the words butt and bottle make it difficult to establish which word is the true root of butler. The cupbearer who took the jugs and bottles prepared by the butler and served beverages to the guests at the table. The carver who sliced up roasted fowl or meats into manageable portions for the diners. Carving was among the services that pages had to learn as part of their education as gentlemen. And being allowed to carve for one's lord was a signal honor. The steward... The master of ceremonies who coordinated and directed the staff and was responsible for ensuring that all of them discharged their duties properly and that all dishes were presented correctly. In households of minor size and prestige, several of these positions might be held by the same person, but in the great houses each position would be filled by only one person, though he might have several assistants. While in the greatest of houses, those of kings and emperors, the people serving in these roles would be nobility themselves, and would wait upon the host and his most important guests personally, 
while ordinary servants or young noblemen in training attended to the other guests. Surviving illustrations show women cooking and serving meals only in domestic scenes of the middle and lower classes. For the nobility, written accounts and illustrations of feasts indicate that only men and boys served in the kitchens and at table of most households. Use of only males in table service at feasts was tied in part to the fact that feasts were often displays of political and social bonds. Thus, the key serving positions provided a highly visible opportunity for, and their male children, who hoped to one day succeed to their father's positions and were currently serving as pages in the Lord's household, to publicly serve their lords, symbolically acting out their political and social relationships. As for the kitchen, the few chefs whose names have survived, such as Shikwart and the internationally famous Talivent, were men. Further, all references to lesser kitchen staff, as well as all illustrations of preparations for feasts, depict only males of various ages. This limited evidence does not mean that women never served as chefs or in other capacities on the cooking staffs of noble households, but it does make it seem that these staffs were predominantly male, perhaps indicative that work in the large institutional kitchens of medieval courts was backbreaking work in a hot, smoky environment not unlike a forge or smithy, which were also home to male-dominated workforces. Kitchens evolved dramatically over the course of the Middle Ages. Initially, cooking was done over open fire pits in the dirt floors of buildings, with pits even being located in the center of the same hall in which the food was served, and thus serving to heat the building as well. However, the risk of fire encouraged construction of kitchens as separate buildings, away from the primary residential structures. Covered walkways were often built with these kitchens so that the food could be kept warm and dry on its journey to the table. Further improvements in construction led to the development of hoods over the open pits and later on hearths with chimneys located along the outside walls of the building, improving ventilation and providing places to attach hooks and racks for suspending pots and pans over the cooking fire. By the 14th century, kitchens were being constructed in stone as part of residential complexes at palaces and monastic houses. Some of the surviving kitchens are huge, reflecting the large numbers of people they fed. For example, the kitchens at the abbeys of Durham in England and Fontevraud in France are large octagons about 40 feet across. Making them octagonal maximized the number of walls available for hearths, and the overall rounded shape minimized the distance between any open hearths in the center of floor and additional flues located in the walls for venting their heat and smoke. These kitchens also had high, tapering ceilings that lead up to an opening capped with an open work cupola that helped provide a fresh air intake for the building and improve air circulation. To further improve the airflow and provide some light, other than just the glow from the hearths, these kitchens usually had many large windows fitted with louvered shutters. Some of these windows were also used as additional doorways to permit scullions and other workers to easily move large bulky items, such as bundles of wood for the fire or sides of beef, into the kitchen. Another interesting, labor-saving feature found in some kitchens were garbage chutes for rapidly and easily moving waste out of the kitchen. One notable example is at Fountains Abbey in England, where the kitchen was built spanning a small river and had a built-in garbage disposal in the form of floor grates that allowed kitchen waste to be dumped directly into the river and carried away downstream. Feasts were generally conducted in the great hall of a castle or palace. This hall was used for many functions besides feasting, typically serving as the facility's primary meeting room where the noble held court and administered justice. It was also unused as sleeping quarters for servants and other members of the household. Only in monasteries, where dining halls called refectories were constructed, was one likely to encounter a room dedicated only to eating. To serve its various roles, the furnishings of the hall were kept very simple. Among the few permanent fixtures in the room was a wooden screen along one end of the hall across the front of the main doors leading outside, usually including the door out to the kitchen. Despite its name, the screen was actually a rather solid wooden wall that stopped the draft from the outside doors from disturbing the hall. 
This space between the outer wall and the screen could also be used as a staging area where foods from the kitchen were inspected before either being taken through doors in the screen into the hall or passed through the serving hatch to waiting servants. Another permanent, though less massive, feature was the sideboard or ombre. This was a large piece of furniture, like a china cabinet or Welsh dresser, with open shelves where the host kept his finest platters, pitchers, goblets, and other serving pieces for use and for display. During the feast, the butler or cellarer used the ombre as a place to prepare flavored wines and to refill the wine jugs. Additional tables, either permanent pieces or temporary ones constructed of boards on trestles, were used by the pantler to prepare the trenchers and by the chef or his staff for final dressing or saucing. At some feasts, dishes were brought out and placed on such tables just so the guests could be amazed by the variety and amounts of foods to which they had to look forward. On such occasions, these tables earned the name groaning boards from their creaking and groaning under the weight of the dishes. As for the rest of the fittings, dining tables were usually temporary, again constructed of boards and trestles, with one table often set up on a platform, making it the high table where the Lord the most important guests and member of their retinues. Additional tables were assembled as needed, typically in a U-shape, with parallel tables projecting down from either end of the high table. Seating was on long benches. For much of the first half of the Middle Ages, these benches were also used as beds by the servants and other members of the household who slept in the hall and were easily stacked along the side of the hall when not in use. Those seated at the high table used any chairs and stools available, preferably with cushions. However, illustrations indicate that even they often shared communal benches. Guests were seated according to their rank and importance, with the most important seated closest to the host and the least significant seated farthest away. Finally, beneath it all, the floor of the hall was covered in rushes, but these were not simply loose rushes strewn about the floor. Illuminations, such as those done for the Duke of Berry in the 15th century, show that the rushes were often woven into large mats that completely covered the floor of the hall, providing an absorbent and resilient, yet disposable, carpeting. Though limited by what produce and other foodstuffs were in season in the area, chefs for the great households had access to broadest selections of ingredients possible. All the items available to the common people, including fruit, vegetables, eggs, cheese, nuts, butter, wine, verges, fish, poultry, herbs, and livestock, and two more items that most distinguished meals of the nobility from those of lesser men, spices and game. Mentioned before in the context of food preservation, spices were a key ingredient of fine cooking in the Middle Ages, particularly after the Frankish nobility and many others had gotten a taste for them, either while on crusade in the Middle East or in the more cosmopolitan European courts that obtained the seasonings as part of the increased trade with that region that followed initial Christian victories. A few spices, such as saffron, were grown around the Mediterranean in Italy and Spain. Many others, including black pepper, cardamom, and sugar, were grown in Asia Minor or the Middle East. Cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, and others, though imported through the Middle East, were grown much further away in India and other parts of Asia. The distance these commodities had to be shipped, as well as the small quantities in which they were produced, ensured that they commanded a high price by the time they reached consumers in Europe. Difficulties in equating prices of several centuries ago to modern money make it impossible to state an exact price for spices that would be meaningful and accurate. However, based on studies of food, diet, and prices in late 13th century England, the relative expense of spices can be expressed as follows. Eight bushels of grain, referred to as a quarter, was approximately enough to make the bread and pottage portion of one person's diet for a year. A quarter of grain usually sold for around six shillings. Prices for spices range from one to three shillings per pound, with especially rare spices like saffron commanding from 12 to 16 shillings per pound. Though a pound was a large amount of spice, the comparatively high cost of spices is obvious. Some attempts were made to find alternate sources for spices, particularly after the collapse of the Crusader states in the Middle East made direct trade with the region more difficult for a time. 
The biggest success in lessening dependence on foreign sources was the spread of the cultivation of sugar to Sicily, Cyprus, Malta, and Rhodes by the late 13th century, reducing the distance it had to be shipped to markets in the rest of Europe. However, the backbreaking labor required to harvest the cane, chop it, grind it, boil it, and repeatedly refine it to yield fine, white sugar kept prices high. Thus, most people continued to rely on honey for sweetening their foods, while sugar remained a treat for the wealthy. The cost and their medicinal properties, either real or imagined, meant that sugar and most other spices were sold by apothecaries, those forerunners of modern pharmacists, and some noble households employed their own apothecaries to whom the spices were entrusted. Records from one household show that the chef had to formally requisition spices from the apothecary for each meal designating the specific amounts he needed. Clearly, spices were valued treasures. This tight control of spices also suggests that, despite the lack of measurements in most surviving recipes and the large numbers of different spices often used in preparing a single dish, medieval cooks were more sparing in their use of spices than was long thought. Besides securing and portioning out spices to the chef, and the more traditional role of preparing any medications needed, the household apothecary was also responsible for making dragees, candies made of sugar mixed with spice that were served at the end of feasts to freshen the breath and provide a small, sweet treat to cap off the meal, not unlike modern after-dinner mints. As we all know from the stories of Robin Hood, deer, boars, bears, and other game animals were reserved exclusively for the sport of and consumption by the nobility. There were many motives for this strict regulation, most of which will be explored in the chapter on playing and relaxing, but only a few that concern us at the moment. Medieval nobility enjoyed hunting and enjoyed the taste of the meat of game animals, so much so that sending gifts of freshly killed game was a common gesture of goodwill between neighboring nobility. Game dishes included many that are enjoyed today, like venison steaks and roasted boar, as well as some showpieces like boar's head. But there were others that include some meals that would be quite unappetizing to most modern diners, including bear paws, entrails and testicles of boar, stag, and a number of other animals, and a selection of other organ meats. However, game was not unique in providing such dishes. Virtually every internal organ of the cow or calf, from brains and lungs down to stomachs and intestines, appeared on medieval dining tables at one time or another. In part, organ meat may have been a delicacy, but its widespread consumption likely reflects the fact that people could not afford to routinely waste edible animal tissue, especially since the organs constituted a large part of the animal's total weight. So, despite its elevated status, game was usually prepared like any other meat, though its privileged consumers presumably appreciated that its flavor and texture was superior to those of the mundane, domestic meats. In fact, the survival of several recipes in the Menage de Paris handbook and elsewhere for making mock game out of domestic animal meat indicate that medieval palates were quite able to discern between game and domestic animals and preferred the former. As mentioned previously, chefs in the Middle Ages used the same methods available to us today broiling, grilling, baking, roasting, frying, boiling, and poaching. Some of the combinations of methods, and especially the combinations of ingredients and seasonings, may seem alien, but examining these dishes, particularly in light of many foreign cuisines that have swept the U.S. and the rest of the Western world in recent years, shows that most of these foods were not as bizarre and vile-tasting as they have long seemed to historians. For example, how about a chicken dish made with the chicken roasted or boiled, smitten and hacked small, and then seethed and served in a sauce of galangal, grains of paradise, and milk of almonds? At first glance, not many of us might be eager to gulp this down, but what if it were described as a delicately flavored curry, with pieces of boneless or semi-boneless chicken simmered in a rich sauce made from ginger, cardamom, and powdered almonds? Putting the archaic cooking instructions aside, that's what this dish translates to. Galangal was one of the names given to ginger in medieval Europe. The name may have been derived from galalangal, a spice related to ginger that is still used in Thai cooking. 
Grains of Paradise, is generally believed to have been a name for cardamom, which is an integral part of curry powder and many other elements of Indian cooking. Finally, milk of almonds is simply a liquid made by combining dried, ground almonds with water or milk. There are other elements of medieval cuisine suggestive of Asian cuisine as well, such as the common medieval spice mixture, powdered douce, which, though recipes varied slightly, usually contained cardamom, coriander, and ginger, not unlike many Indian curry powders. Thus, far from being either bland or a distasteful hodgepodge of spices, it seems that some of the finest dishes in medieval cookery may have been subtly and complexly flavored, surprisingly delicious even to modern palates. Another type of dish that was quite popular at feasts were pies. Most of these pies would be called pot pies today because they were filled with mixtures of meats, poultry, or fish and vegetables and cheese. They were made in a variety of sizes, and part of their popularity may have been that they could be made in individual serving portions, or were at least easy to cut up into manageable pieces. Beyond just preparing food that tasted good by contemporary standards, chefs also had to make dishes that were eye-catching or even spectacular. Such dishes included swans or peacocks that were killed, skinned, cooked, and then redressed in their skins and set up in a lifelike pose. One chef even took this further and redressed cooked geese inside the skins of peacocks to surprise and delight his master's guests. According to the chef's directions for this dish, part of the delight can be attributed to the fact that goose is more tasty and far more tender than peacock. A similar surprise dish was the cockatrice, made by attaching the upper half of a rooster to the hind end of a roast piglet. There were even more outlandish dishes that were not meant to be eaten, but to entertain instead. Typically presented between courses in the meal, these included pies made with pre-baked crusts, into which songbirds or other live animals were placed, before the top crust was placed over them and sealed. Among other entertaining dishes were castles or complete dioramas made of painted pastry or almond paste. These dishes were sometimes taken to extremes. In the early 15th century, Chiquart, the same chef who dressed geese as peacocks, also recorded creating a large model castle with animals that breathed real fire mounted in the castle's towers and many other incredible features. The castle was so large, in fact, that it had room for four live musicians and their instruments. And another noteworthy feature of Chiquart's castle was a fountain that pumped out rose water and spiced wines. Fountains that produced flows of different wines, sometimes with the selection changing as the feast progressed to match the different foods being served, were especially popular in France and adjoining regions. Some were relatively simple, resembling large coffee urns with a raised tank that used gravity to supply the spigots below. But others actually shot the wine up and out through nozzles, like miniature garden fountains. These more complex fountains required concealed servants operating manual pumps to keep the wine flowing under pressure through small metal tubes from tanks containing reserves of wine to the fountain itself. Fountains weren't the only decorative but functional objects found on medieval dining tables. Far more common and essential was the salt cellar. These containers, sometimes called nefs, were often highly ornamented and usually made in the shape of ships, perhaps symbolic of the sea, that most plentiful source of salt. Beyond its practical function of holding fine grain salt with which diners could season their food, salt cellars were used to denote the comparative ranks of the diners. The best quality salt cellars were of course placed on the high table. Additional salt cellars were placed on the other dining tables that extended away from the high table. As mentioned before, guests were seated at these tables in descending order of importance, with the highest ranking being seated at or near the top end of the table nearest the high table. At these tables, guests, who though not important enough to merit a seat at the high table, were reassured of their host's esteem by having the salt cellars placed near them, between themselves and those inferior guests seated even farther away from the host. As the seating arrangements and placement of salt cellars as symbolic dividers suggests, feasts were conducted with considerable formality. In Western Europe, there are written guidelines for behavior at feasts dating as far back as the early 12th century, 
proving that conduct at these occasions was expected to conform to certain rules of etiquette. This is not to say that such rules were observed in the halls of Viking lords in earlier times, or at peasant weddings, harvest festivals, and other celebrations at parish halls even during the late Middle Ages. Then as now, despite the existence of rules of etiquette, good manners were not always practiced. But it does mean that most of the aristocracy throughout Europe knew and observed certain rules about how to behave themselves during a feast. Among these rules were, Be sure your fingernails are clean before you go to the table. This admonition was particularly important since tableware was very limited and most foods were eaten by being picked up and directly held in the fingers. Further, since feasting was a communal activity, with even the most important guests often sharing a cup and other dishes with at least one other diner, the prospect of picking up a piece of meat in sauce from a bowl or plate which someone had just dipped his or her dirty fingernails into was no less unappetizing then than it is now. Wash your hands before the meal. Again, the limited tableware and intimate communal nature of feasting made this an important rule. Handwashing was sometimes performed ritualistically with the Lord who was hosting the feast pouring the water for the most important of his guests. More commonly, the host's ewerer or another of his servants would pour the water, which was kept in a small ewer or pitcher and scented with flower petals and spices when they were available. The water was caught in a small basin held below the guests' hands. Some of these pitchers and basins have survived. The pitchers were often made in the shape of animals or people, with the mouth of the figure serving as the spout of the pitcher, reminiscent of those dribbling cow. Creamers found at truck stops and country-style restaurants across America's heartland. Chew with your mouth closed, don't talk with your mouth full, and don't let food in your mouth recirculate back out into the communal drinking cup. Don't handle a piece of food unless you are going to eat it. Accept the food placed in front of you and don't make a grab for seemingly better food in dishes placed before another guest. Etiquette guides from the 13th and later centuries further refine the rules. Don't gorge. This may seem incredible given the numbers and amounts of food served at many of the recorded feasts of the Middle Ages. However, gluttony was a sin and overindulgence is repellent. Besides just wanting to appear gracious, diners knew they would be inundated with food and so took and ate only small amounts of each dish, pacing themselves so they would have the room to enjoy the entire meal from beginning to end. Don't get drunk. Again, this may seem like an unavoidable consequence at meals where all the beverages contained alcohol. Yet, like the Romans before them, people of the Middle Ages routinely added water to their wine, diluting its alcohol content and allowing them to drink more without getting drunk. The water was taken from the purest sources available, but adding water was obviously less hygienic than drinking pure wine. Presumably they thought that the wine adequately purified the water. The butler oversaw the diluting of wine served to most guests, but the occupants of the high table were normally given undiluted wine with a jug of water so they could mix their own to suit their tastes. Don't pick your teeth fingernails or nose. Don't fidget, slouch, or rest your arms and elbows on the table. Don't pet dogs and cats during the meal. Don't curse or bring up any controversial topics or any distasteful ones, like diseases, operations, or off-color or ribald stories. Turn away from other diners if you need to sneeze or cough. Go to the toilet before the meal to purge your system and lessen the chance of embarrassingly passing gas at the table. Don't burp at the table. For men, be polite to the women present and don't gawk at them. These are just some of the high points of what was considered good manners for feast goers. Medieval feasts were certainly amazing spectacles, but they don't appear to have been spitting, belching, wench pinching, drunken free for alls. But this was reasonable, given that feasts, despite their obvious festive aspects, were also in some respects a business dinner with the boss. For most of those in attendance, Feasts were also an opportunity for the Lord hosting the event to fully display his wealth and power through the magnitude of his hospitality and the splendor of his hall. 
Thus, feasts were both social events and ceremonial occasions at which political ties as and other important social bonds were recognized and reinforced. Therefore, it should be no surprise that attendees tried to conduct themselves with dignity and decorum to distinguish themselves and prove their worth to all present, especially their feudal lord and any guests of high rank who could advance their careers and fortunes. However, this depiction may be too straight-laced. The fact that guides on manners were often reissued and updated suggests that conduct at feasts may not have been uniformly genteel. Perhaps, with all that wine and good food, feastgoers had difficulty keeping themselves in check and engaged in regrettable behavior, such as is seen even today at company picnics or office holiday parties, when bosses and co-workers have a few too many drinks and, with reduced inhibitions, say or do inappropriate things. Besides the food, which was often quite entertaining in itself, guests were treated to playlets performed by silent actors, tumbling by acrobats, juggling an allegorical tableau presented between courses, or at the conclusion of the meal. Throughout the meal, musicians played, with suitable flourishes to draw attention to presentations of spectacular dishes or performances. They also provided music for any dancing the guests may have indulged in after the feast and they would have had time for dancing, games, and other less amusing activities, like meeting to discuss business or political matters, after the feast because most feasts were held in the middle of the day, not at night. Throughout Europe and all levels of medieval society, the midday meal was traditionally the big meal of the day. Breakfasts were small, simple meals, just enough to get you through until lunch. Evening meals were also relatively small, perhaps relying on leftovers from lunch for much of their content. Night feasts are recorded, but the foods and numbers of courses listed indicate that they were usually much lighter, shorter affairs than the big noontime feasts. Also, nighttime feasts were seldom held, except as part of prolonged festivities when guests were staying for several days, and so required entertaining and feeding during the evening as well. While feasting during the middle of the day may not line up with some modern ideas about the Middle Ages, it does make it more understandable how medieval nobility were able to withstand these marathon meals and remain awake to the end.